Hello and welcome to another Rich Challenge Let's Square Theatre podcast. This week's guest is the brilliant John Robbins. You'll enjoy this one. He's very, very funny. Um, if you like these podcasts and would like to help keep them going and help us to make another series of As It Occurs To Me, hopefully on video, then go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges, either make a one-off donation or a monthly donation, and all that money will go towards making more content for you. It's up to you. You don't have to if you don't want to, or just tell your friends about it. Uh, every month we have a prize draw for people who give a monthly donation. There's also a secret channel and lots of other stuff as well you get for giving a monthly donation of a pound or more. Uh, but there's always a big end of year draw with lots of prizes so I'll get together lots of interesting stuff but in, included in the stuff I'm giving away on the 31st of December 2015 you may be too late if you're watching this in the future is this look it's a smartwatch made by Garmin it's worth 200 pounds um, I didn't like it very much so I bought an Apple watch instead which is still all right but you know it's a waste of money basically both of them but um that's, you know, you can put that on eBay, probably get 50 quid for that. There's a charger as well, don't worry. Uh, so there'll be that and other stuff. So uh, if you want to um, have a chance of winning that and some other bits of rubbish from my office, which you'll be able to put on eBay as well, um, then go to gofasterstripe.com slash badges. Give us a pound or more a month, and you're also helping to st us to create more content like this. And, you know, you you'll feel less bad about watching all this stuff for free. All right, hope you enjoy this. Sorry, a bit of a cold time so in my pajamas, but you know it's Christmas, so fuck you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. <laughs> He's like a caterpillar who's changed into a butterfly in front of your eyes. Please welcome Richard Herring! Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Welcome to Richard Herring's Let's Stay a Theatre podcast. Or I was down um, at Big Al's on uh, Happy Days in the bar in the, 1950s, in the 1950s there. I was in the toilet in there. And a man came in wearing a leather jacket and he was calling Rahul So I don't know if that is, I don't know if that's an indication of anything. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm feeling quite good today. Uh, you know, it's different. I've been kind of ill through a lot of these or just tired because I've got a stupid fucking baby. Uh, and, uh, God, it's annoying. It was, it was fun to begin with and then fucking hell, it just never ends. Uh, so, uh, I grow up. So I, I was trying to feed her with a cup today. It's going all over us, stupid idiot. Uh, so, uh, but I'm feeling quite good today. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I live in Shepherd's Bush at the moment still, as uh, many of you know, my house is for sale. If anyone wants to... Still for sale, but no one... It's a beautiful place. I don't know, because the Westfield is there at uh, Shepherd's Bush. I don't know if you were reading the papers this week, but a pregnant woman received a, gave a blowjob to her husband in the Westfield, in a public area of the Westfield. She was pregnant, and... Uh, her kids were also around, and they were walking up to her. This, is, this happened in Shepherd's Bush. This is the classiest thing that's ever happened in Shepherd's Bush. The kids were around, and they didn't stop doing the blowjob, and then the woman, when she finished the blowjob, she spat her husband's gametes into a tissue and threw them behind a pot plant. And that is... And on the day this news came out, I went to the Westfields in the hope of seeing... I hope of seeing... Or getting involved, you know, because I think if, like, the... If that starts happening, if a kid can walk up and they're still getting in, if just a man sort of sighed or up and sat. <laughs> I thought that might happen. There's a lot of more people at the Westfield than there usually would be on a Friday. That's all I'm saying. I was very disappointed not to say But I think the Westfield, I'm not, I've got no evidence for this. I think they might have planted that story in an attempt to get more people to come to it. In the run-up to Christmas. <laughs> Because, you know, it's tempting to go down. Because if you either, if you like to see a pregnant woman give her husband a blowjob, that's good for you. If you like the idea that it might happen to you. Or if you just like giving blowjobs to strangers, that is the place. It's the place to go. So come and buy my house in Sheffield. <laughs> if you want to see that. Uh, so, uh, look, we're going to crack straight on. So uh, my first guest, and uh, my only guest this week. <laughs> Can't wait till next week's show. Uh, is... 
He's probably best known for his instructional internet-only video for the Carling Rear home draft system. <laughs> Sadly, that is true. This <laughs> it is John Robbins, ladies and gentlemen. Here he comes, hopefully. Yeah, there he is. John Robbins, sit down. That's a microphone. You're speaking in that way. Hello, everyone. That's how that works. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. So, you're looking at me so young. I'm looking at you so no, young. No, you look at him, you're so young, you're a very young man. I'm, I did a, uh, a run-through for a non-broadcasted thing. Yeah. And um, it was me and Simon Evans and two other comedians, and they referred to us as the old-timers. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I sort of accidentally... Well, Simon Evans is an old-timer. You were born in... Uh, you know, I, can, I, was sick, I was working on my O-levels when you were born in Bristol. Yeah, 1982. Yeah. Probably, maybe, yeah, just choosing which O-levels I was going to do. It just makes me sad, the way that, that time passes. Uh, so, <laughs> everyone will want to talk about, uh, would want to know about your instructional video for, is it for <laughs> was it for Carling? Home? Yeah. How, what happened in that? What was that? Can we, can we see that still online? No, it's, it's unavailable. Okay. <laughs> which shows that they were wrong to trust a sort of <laughs> a freelance producer who knew me from outside comedy. Right. Who put wanted to put together a video of how to use it's like a keg that you could put in a fridge yeah and um, Is it, was it that complicated that it needed an online video because that doesn't sound well they had three kegs for us to use yeah and i got the first two wrong okay <laughs> so that they they sprayed over a camera <laughs> so that that immediately it was one of those things when i was just sort of starting out so it was more money than i would earn for a gig but phenomenally low for what <laughs> you would expect and so the damage of the camera was more than my fee <laughs> and then the third one got right but I had wow. to drive to a gig and I was worried I didn't want to drink actually physically imbibe <laughs> the carling and so I, I kept having to sort of sip and then like the lady in Westfield yeah. <laughs> just sort of spit it out pop it into a pot plant that that could be like a version of I've only just today seen the John Lewis Christmas advert yeah but there could be a version of that for the Westfield, where it's CCTV of that happening, <laughs> of the couple in the shopping centre, and then it just ends with the same hashtag, <laughs> remind someone they're loved, <laughs> by, by giving them a blowy in a shopping centre. If you went into a shopping centre, you or me, or one, a man, and around, um, did that yourself, yeah. with kids around, you'd be arrested and... What, if you masturbated to, yeah. in the Westfield and, and children were coming up and, uh, and yeah. touching your knee and going, get, no, look, get off from yeah. yeah, you would probably be arrested for that. Yeah. You? And but they were arrested and they'd been charged. So no, they, yeah. they, they, they were let off with... Oh, well, they? they got a suspended sentence. She said her hormones were all over the place. Yeah. And <laughs> if I said that... <laughs> I just come oh, I'm just a mess. I mean, it's up and down. And, uh. Well, there are times, you know, when you're younger, your hormones are all over the place and you mm. need to have... A, but you'd probably go in the toilet there. there the, the, there's plenty of toilet facilities at the Westfield. I would suggest they could have gone into a disabled loo. And it's not... I, I'm not advocating that. But if, you, uh, if your hormones are all over the place, in a way, you are disabled. So... Well, why... They should have... And if... Uh, or if you just really want a blowjob. Or they should have actual booths yeah. for specifically for that in all places where there are more than 10 shops. Yeah. Well, now they've got, coming up at the Westfield, they've got a Christmas grotto. Uh, so you, yeah. could put the, you could put the kids in there while, and, then, and then you could go back. And actually, I don't know why they've done this, but they have genuinely put a Shrek in the Christmas grotto. <laughs> they, they have. I don't know if that's a homage to me. Because it's not like... Shrek isn't a Christmas thing, right? So it's like, Father Chris if you go into a Christmas grotto, can I see Father Christmas? I don't want really to see a Shrek. I mean, I do, but I mean, kids, <laughs> kids don't want to see. Or I hope Father Christmas is there as well as a Shrek. What if it was a Shrek dressed as Father Christmas? Yeah, I'm, I fear that that is what it is, and that, to me, is an abomination against, <laughs> against both Christianity and the law of Shrek. <laughs> what? What religion does Shrek most identify with? <laughs> <laughs> it's an ogre-based, you know, I don't know if the ogres believe in that they were, they're kind of fantastical creatures in themselves, aren't they? Mm. If you live in a fantastical world, it must be hard to believe in a god. There are already fairies and elves and stuff in it, and magical 
There's a, definitely a leprechaun in there because there's... Uh, what's his name? Is it leprechaun, the guy in, the, in Shrek 3? Well, it's, it's difficult, is it, because... It there's, a, like a, there's that little ginger-haired guy who steals his life. It's a sort of... The leprechaun? Come on! <laughs> is there no one... Rumpelstiltskin, that's who it is. Yeah, he's kind of a, he's kind of a leprechaun, isn't he? But how, uh, <laughs> you need to impose sort of self... Uh, you need to impose rules in fantasy worlds. Yeah. Because obviously if you can have anything, then it's hard to have narrative. So like with Harry Potter, which I'm a big fan of, there's often points where you just go, why, why didn't you just use a spell? <laughs> <laughs> and there's one spell that would have solved every problem in Harry Potter, which is like Axio, yeah. which is where you say Axio broomstick and your broomstick comes to you. So in theory, every single dilemma they have could be the like, Axio Dumbledore. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, Axio, the one thing that will help me now. <laughs> so it, you have to impose your own sort of code as to, in a magical world, as to yeah. what... So God, you might say, couldn't exist in a fantastical... Well, or, or maybe d all the gods exist in this world, because, I mean, the Shrek universe, I'm not sure the original Shrek uh, books are the case, but certainly the films... Oh, no, I'm not going to talk about this exclusively. Um, but then they recently... But the Shrek films, I mean, any, any fairy... I mean, you know, like Rumpelstiltskin and the Gingerbread Man do not exi exist in the same universe. Did they... Are there any sort the of... three little um, pigs, they're not in the same universe. But in Shrek they are, so presumably Zeus is there. Uh, are there any of the original sort of DVDs of Shrek from 2,000 years ago? <laughs> that are sort of like the extant... Yeah texts, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, you could have the, the sort of found the, in a cave. The original Shrek film is quite old. <laughs> <laughs> but like a sort of, um, what do they call them, the, um, the apocryphal... Yeah, the apocryphal testaments so of Shrek. If there's some well, apocryphal that's Shrek. Because Shrek, Shrek himself, as I feel, has become the figurehead of Shreks. And, uh, he's well, just actually, he was his he's brother. Just one of the, he's just one of the Shreks. Yeah. And, you know, any Shrek. A lot of the Shreks who aren't in Shrek feel quite aggrieved mm. that Shrek is... And, and similarly to Jesus, I imagine, there were a lot of, a lot of messiahs at the time. They must be, if they can see, look down, they must be pissed off going, well, I was as good as Jesus well, well, and all a, that stuff. There's Why a good, are they going on about him all the time? There's a good book by Philip Pullman called um, The Good Man, Jesus and the Scoundrel Christ, which sort of posits uh, an alternative gospel where Jesus has a brother. Yes and he takes all the credit for the stuff his brother does. There's also a really good story by uh, Borges, which is impossible to say that without sounding like an absolute cunt. You did. <laughs> you, you succeeded. It's by Borges, actually, guys. But where, it's, um, where Judas is actually the person in the, uh, the New Testament that makes the ultimate sacrifice and saves mankind. Yeah, because right. without him condemning himself to death, yeah. Jesus wouldn't have been sent to the, to the court and wouldn't have been killed. Exactly, so. yeah, of course. So that's good. It was good. Should we, should we owe Judas a big lot of thanks? Because Jesus was all right anyway, wasn't he? His dad was God. Yeah, he would have been he fine. Was, he was fine anyway. He'd have, like, he'd have gone on to work in the company or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> They'd have sorted it out. But, I mean, a lot of these stories in, in the Bible, they can't, God kind of needs the per like Adam and Eve, God needs Eve to eat the apple, otherwise it's just him looking at two naked people in a garden, and that is a, <laughs> that's a, back at the Westfield, really. So, um, <laughs> anyway, we should talk, let's talk about you a little bit, and then we'll get back to Shrek for the, uh, <laughs> for the last 35 minutes and our theories about um, Shrek. You are very good stand-up comedian. Young, st I call you a young stand-up comedian. Thanks, man. That's all right. Because uh, <laughs> I'd kissed a girl by the time you were alive, and so that means... I probably hadn't, actually. Uh, so but I, there's a comedian now, yeah. who I gave, Elliot, Elliot Steele, who I gave a lift back from a gig, and I'd... I'd had Congress with a lady yeah. before he was born. Wow. Which is terrifying. You must have had Congress very young, though, whereas I was quite... For, for me, that pushes the ramp a lot further back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saved myself with the collusion of all the women in the world <laughs> who agreed 
agree. You're a Bristol boy, yes. which is why I like you. So oh. you're maybe born in the same hospital as my nephew in Bristol. I was born in Southmead Hospital. I don't remember what it was. I remember them in hospital. Right, you say it's probably the same. <laughs> probably was. Uh, and, uh, and you lived uh, with a lot of comedians, a kind of a lot of comedians who've gone on to be... You had shared a flat in Bristol. Yeah, got, I lived with a lot of comedians who I don't really know what they're up to now. Yeah. But <laughs> I think one of them does a blog or something. I lived with Russell Howard. Oh, yeah. Uh, John Richardson yeah. and Mark Olver. Mark Olver from uh, the Deal or No Deal warm up. Which I've been sacked from twice. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> so did they forget that they sacked you when they when No, they, they got very desperate and <laughs> like really and uh, called me. Uh, what happened was they asked me to go back and I always used to dread it because you have to watch three episodes of Deal or No Deal unedited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like three episodes of No Deal or No Deal on TV for 45 minutes is one thing, but some of them would take two and a half hours of people basically thinking their life was going to change because they. It was horrible because you'd see people convince themselves that they deserved money and happiness, which everyone does, but because it's random, it sort of falls equally to people who really, I saw, oh, the worst one was this guy whose life story was just harrowing. And he had all the big numbers, the big power five, uh, <laughs> were in play. And then and they didn't show this in the show, but some one of the contestants dropped a box. It opened oh, and yeah. they saw the amount. So they had to then swap all the boxes around and the next five numbers were the big ones and he ended up with like 10p and you're like, why do this to anyone? <laughs> and so, but I, the first time I got sacked was for making a joke about Noel. <laughs> slash being disinterested in the show. <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm convinced it was because I made a joke about Noel, but I think they might say it was because I used to roll my eyes every time they asked me to do any work. <laughs> and the second time is because I was so hung over that I was sick in Noel's to toilet, <laughs> which is not a euphemism. <laughs> and uh, he has his own toilet, which is fair enough, because yeah, no, if definitely. he needs to go and come back, and he's yeah. an, an astonishing professional. Yeah. I've never seen anyone deal with a live TV like or he does. Or not deal with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I was, I mean, anyone would have been sacked in that. I was just being sick. It's the only <laughs> time I've ever been sick the morning after drinking. Was it, Noel Edmonds in the toilet at the time doing a poo? <laughs> No, he was. He was. Is uh, it a really tiny toilet? Is that why no, he has a disabled toilet? toilet? Is it? Yeah. Don't, don't approve of that. Of. Don't approve of Noel Edmonds having the disabled toilet. Well, there were other disabled toilets. No disabled people had access to this toilet anyway. There was absolutely. They wouldn't have been able to get in there. Let's go and pick it. Uh, deal or no deal. <laughs> with lots of disabled people saying, like, "We want Noel's tiny loo." He he loves disabled people. No, no, I'm sure he does. In, a, in an entirely, in, in, in an entirely good way. It was, it, there was one time, it was remarkable, there was someone um, in the audience, because they have sort of these devoted fans, and one guy um, had, uh, obviously, learning difficulties quite severe, and made involuntary noises uh, throughout the record, which sort of was very difficult for them to deal with. Noel was fantastic, and he said, he sort of made a point of showing the camera, so introducing himself, saying, hello, we've got a very special person in the audience, and there may be involuntary noises, but don't feel awkward. It was just wonderful yeah. and very... And the, the staff backstage were not using such kind language. <laughs> like, there were producers going, someone's going to get fired for this. Right. Because they let... The, well, they used language that's yeah. not, not very, not very PC, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> that, I can understand why they don't want you back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I'm happy with that decision as well. <laughs> it's a hard job, though. Mark, Mark is fantastic as a warm-up. Oh, he does phenomenal. a lot of the lot of those shows. He does uh, Pointless as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. So what what was the flat like? Was it a, was it always funny in the flat with all these funny people? It Did you think of inviting Justin Lee Collins to be part of the flat? <laughs> <laughs> or was he deliberately ostracised? The, well, this was pre his crisis. Yeah. I met him once. I've never ever met anyone like him just so um, accommodating and friendly. 
So I'm, I met, this is before any of these people involved were very famous, but I went for tapas with Russell Howard, Justin E. Collins and Alan Carr. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in Bristol. And I turned up, and I it was a, a, a sort of an open spot amateur comic. And I, I knew what they saw. Obviously, Alan Carr was a big deal to me, and Justin E. Collins. And I went in and sat down, and Justin E. Collins had never met me before, didn't know me from Adam, but immediately, like, Oh, you're John, are you all right there, John? You got some of this tapas? Get some of that butter, John. You will love that butter. And some of that bread. I want to see you eat two bits of that bread with some of that butter. We've got asparagus. It's white asparagus, but I still trust it. And, <laughs> and immediately just felt, made me feel welcome. And, but there was a sort of, um, I got, this is pre his issues he had, but I did get a sense from him that whenever no one was expecting him to be on form, he sort of would go back into a, a bunker of his mind. Right. And his sort of face would, if you caught him when no one was looking at him, you would sense that he was sad, um, oh. which I think turned out to be the case. It was. And may not now be. Did he make you write what other meals tapas you'd had with other comedians <laughs> down in the bunker patch? <laughs> I was just there. I, you know, I, no. All he, I liked about that that I'm not. What the thing I'm, I enjoyed about that court case was that she kept referring to it as a puck, not a notepad, but as a pucker pad, as if, <laughs> as if she'd been sponsored by. Because that's an odd thing to say. He writes everything down in a pucker pad. He writes everything down. Yeah. Is all you need to say. You don't need to specify the brand. Yeah. I don't know if pucker pad had sponsored her to. But I love that. I love it when people sort of needlessly mention brands. It's quite a sort of Alan Partridge <laughs> thing to do. He's being quite focused on all the. All the brand names, oh, well. but it was quite funny, flat in different ways as well. Yeah. They're all because. Um, well, John Richardson is notoriously uh, OCD about. Well, he did lots of routines about being OCD about the things being in the right cutlery drawer and all that sort of thing. Yes. Was it was that true to form, or was he? It was true to a certain extent, um, obvi and obviously, we would tease him whenever he showed signs of not having OCD <laughs> because we were like, oh well, it's all just a load of bullshit. You've left a spoon over there. <laughs> So in a way, we sort of forced him to maintain <laughs> a level of OCD far above that which he naturally had <laughs> in order that we didn't think he was a phony. Yeah. Um, and Russell, t you couldn't really pick a worse person to live with if you had OCD than <laughs> Russell. Because he would, in a very charming way, if you complained that he had left a bowl of Ricicles on the floor, which would be your daily occurrence. <laughs> or he would he would go, I'm Russell Howard, <laughs> which is wouldn't be funny for him to do now, <laughs> but because he wasn't famous then, is a really funny thing to do. I'm Russell Howard. Deal with it. And um, and all the I started drinking in that again. I gave up drinking before the week before my first ever gig. Right. And it was in that house that I started drinking again because because of John Richardson <laughs> cooking. So he made, a, he made a lamb shank and had some white wine with it. And I had some white wine. I thought, I haven't had a drink for a year and a half. I'm allowed to treat myself with a drink. And then their careers took off. And I think he knew <laughs> in a way that it was the way to sort of stop me yeah. sort of progressing quite as fast was to make me Turned me back into an alcoholic. Right. For Ten years. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, 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 you've stopped drinking again now. Uh, or, or do you I, drink a bit I now? stopped again <clears throat> in um, this morning. This morning. <laughs> uh, no, I stopped again in 2010, I think, for right. a year, and then I stopped again two months ago okay. after. Um, Meeting, you know, I did a gig with you. Yeah. <laughs> I did a gig with you and Sarah and yeah. Adam Buxton. Yes. And I had such a, I was just, uh, one of those days that you think I'm so lucky to do what I do because I'd met, I'd done a wonderful gig and the gig was great and I'd met Adam Buxton who's a bit of a hero of mine and he was really lovely and we had a long chat about music. And then I got really drunk and went home and found myself in front of a mirror kind of berating myself for being awful. And then you kind of think, well, what on earth are you doing, you weird idiot? <laughs> You've had a lovely day. Yeah. And I thought, well, I need to stop this for a while then. And then that lasted three weeks. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm fine again, okay. I think. I hope. I don't know. I got very sad the other night, so if my girlfriend hears this, she will, she will debate that. Yeah. 
it's difficult as a comedian because, you know, I've been through... I, I, I like drinking, and I've been through times when I drink a lot and think, times when I stop drinking, and I'm drinking again at the moment a bit. But, you know, it's, it's difficult because it's always there, mm. and it's very easy to... You can perform... Do you, you, do you perform with drinking? Is no, it, is it and that's sort of a rule I am really glad I have, is that I very rarely... I'll never drink before I go on stage, unless it's like a late night gig in Edinburgh and I've had a, a couple of pints or something. And sometimes if I'm hosting a show, I'll, I'll have a drink like, as I brought on the last act. Yeah. And very occasionally, if I know the setting is appropriate, I will sort of let myself have a few too many drinks. But I, 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 I'm glad I'm not a comic who can go on drunk. Because, it, and this w was, would be, is, this is what uh, Russell Howard said about it, which I agree with, which is that A, it, it sort of blunts your sword. Yeah. And B, sort of people pay money to see you do your job. So it's unfair of you to relax before <laughs> you've provided the service that they are paid for. Yeah. And it's not fair if people have one night a week where they can come and relax and enjoy themselves for you to <laughs> sort of be enjoying yourself in that way. No, I agree. And weirdly, I don't ever drink before a gig, but yeah. at that gig, <laughs> I did with you, I did. Because it was an afternoon gig at a festival, yeah. and we were out with my, my, my wife and daughter came, and yeah. it just felt like, oh, this is so lovely, and there was beer. And I probably drank three beers before I went on. And it was really, I, I felt, <laughs> I was so drunk. <laughs> and, it was and it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. And it was, but it was terrifying, because I realised I wasn't in control at all. And sometimes I'm, I enjoy being on stage and losing control and not knowing what I'm going to say, which is what I mainly do in this podcast. But if I'd had three beers, and we'd be, I mean, we could talk about some terrible things. Well, I think there's a, <laughs> that in a sense that it's better for you to be drunk if you can make a thing of that than it is for you to be have two pints and just be crap at your job. Yeah. Because it puts your brain and your mouth about a second... That's out it. Sink. Well, you can't, you can't react, but also it is just that feeling of slight, oh, I'm slurring words slightly, or you can't quite tell, and can't, I can't remember what's coming yeah. up next. So it's, it's a slight tip. Don't do it, kids. Don't drink. <laughs> Don't try to be like me. And be <laughs> There's a lot of kids out here looking up to me, especially, especially at home. So well, well, Don't ever drink, or you'll end up like... No, and you won't. If you like me, uh, don't, don't drink... Because I say so, if you don't like me, don't drink or you'll end up like me. So now we're cut. Um, you, you'd mentioned your girlfriend, who's also a stand-up comedian. Do you uh, get annoyed about people asking you if you're funny all the time and, w and uh, where, who gets the routines when you have a joke happen between the two of you? Mm. I'm also I'm married to a comedian as well. Yeah, um, my girlfriend is Sarah Pascoe, oh, yeah, comedian. And um, <laughs> I don't really get annoyed about that because it doesn't really happen that often that we get sort of either spoken to as a couple and she's very careful about so we did one thing for the independent uh, before Edinburgh about couples who are comedians I and you did, did you yes, as well yeah. and it was really sort of a lesson for me in um, in being careful about what you say well not what I say it's what the the lady who wrote it said it was a very good article but um the danger is what your partner says on stage about you gets conflated with you. Yeah. So Sarah has a routine about um, uh, men wanting sex less than women at a certain age because male sexual peak is 18 and women's yeah. is 30s. So if you then take that person in that routine to be me, it, you end up with a sentence in the Independent, which is, Sarah Pascoe is more than happy to talk about her boyfriend's low sex drive. <laughs> and you're like, well, uh, um, um, my mum's going to read that, and that's my, currently my only quote from the Independent. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, I think with a couple more, the, the sort of fictions and realities, of, you, when you talk about your partner, yeah. become a bit blurred, and well, people do assume it's all... Act word for word true. You both did shows the same year, sort of about the relationship. Is, is that? Yeah. Well, n n the show I was writing the when I met Sarah was about uh, a sort of nostalgia and the past, and about uh, an experience with a girl at a music festival, which was odd an odd beginning for our relationship. That I was agonising over a show about sort of the one that got away. Right. So then the next year, our relationship had progressed to the point at which I was writing a show about how 
sort of about love and how it's sort of useless as a as a subject for comedy, which means sort of I think there was a line in it when I said, you know, as much as my girlfriend is the answer to every question I've ever asked of the world, uh, comedically she's cancer. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the ideal scenario would be if she died about mid-feb. <laughs> <laughs> giving me a satisfactory ending for the show. So she... We do struggle at times, very occasionally, about things that we hear someone, each other say on stage, or in an interview. Once she said something on um, a radio interview, which I had to sort of go, hey, my mum's yoga group heard you say something quite personal. Because it was on Radio <laughs> 4. And so there's a balance. But yeah. I would never, ever, you know, sh she has to feel she can speak to her experience of the world, which includes our relationship, and I have mine, so we respect that in each yeah. other. And, um, and it's very, uh, I'm, inc I'm incredibly proud of her. And she has a, a determination and uh, work ethic and an intelligence which constantly... Uh, amazes me. She's well, she is. Very, she's you know, she's a phenomenon. And the fact that that gig, which was just nice, you know, this is a fun festival gig, and I'm going to get drunk. She was sitting at a table with about four notebooks, working out what she was going to say. It made me think, oh, maybe I should put work a bit harder. Oh, <laughs> and so it can be it's there. astonishing. <laughs> and I, we sort of have a one of our minor domestic disputes is about how heavy her bag is because it gives her a bad back because <laughs> it's full of like eight notepads <laughs> and two books she's reading and a laptop. But she yeah. can read. We once were in a hotel, and I went to sleep early slash passed out, uh, <laughs> depending on whose version of the story. <laughs> and she was reading a book as she was going to sleep. It was about half 11. And uh, I woke up the next day slash came round, uh, <laughs> depending on whose version of the story. And I said, oh, how was the book? And she went, oh, I finished it. And I was like, you finished it? What time did you get to bed? And she said, oh, about... Five, I read another book afterwards. <laughs> and she'd read another entire book after having read that book. Crazy. She can read, she re oh. Is this because of your low sex drive, do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> she, um, she's writing. And all the book, the pages are all ripped out and yeah. screwed up. <laughs> she's made a little some weird <laughs> nest for herself, like a, a hamster amongst the book tearings. <laughs> She's writing a book about the woman, the female body at the minute. So a lot of the books she reads are, uh, are sort of on that topic. And we have, she will obviously need to express what she's read and sort of um, just vent. So we have a lot of um, chats over breakfast about female genital mutilation yeah, and, right. and rape and consent yeah. and child brides, which, you know, just sets me up for the day. <laughs> <laughs> um. And that show um, is available, you've got your, a couple of your shows available online as audio yeah, I've downloads got a, from your website. On Bandcamp, Bandcamp. johnrobbins.bandcamp.com and they pay what you want. Um, so you, and you can have them for free, you can download them for free right. or set a price. And my last two shows are up there and my current Edinburgh show will be up there at some point soon. And so have you done, how many, how many one-man shows have you done that's Seven. Seven. God. I haven't honest. taken a year off yet. No. Do is good. I had a year off. It was mm. great. Oh, oh, mind you, I did 12 shows here, so it wasn't quite a year <laughs> off, but it was, it was pretty good. And in, in that, the same show about love, and you can also, if you like shows about love, I did one called What is Love Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, when did you do that? That was uh, before you, probably. Was it? Yeah. Definitely before yeah. me. <laughs> I thought the idea of doing a show about love a year... Um, <laughs> In 1981. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, I'll do that. Well, you were but it's the same thing about me to my wife and you know going from uh, the life I had before. It's, it's very. You know, well, mine's essentially the same. It's so the same theme, but it's a very different show. Well, if you want as much crossover, compare them and let us know who's yeah, is best. That'd be a good idea. You've got. You don't pay what you like for mine. Mine has a set price. Right. <laughs> 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 GoFasterStrike.com. Uh, but are you brave enough within that show to do a routine about Stuart Lee, which is not exactly flattering towards him? No, I have not escaped the gaze of Sauron's eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
I obviously, uh, like all uh, comedians, uh, have massive respect for Stu and a big fan. Yeah. And Not all comedians. No, well, no, some. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when he's sort of uh, first began the the routines about other comics, obviously it was the it was the big chat topic yeah. in lots of dressing rooms and stuff. And and a few things happened. I was quite in a difficult time preparing for my two thousand and. 13 Edinburgh show and uh, did what I think a lot of people do. I think comics are this, but sort of writing thought pieces late at night on your laptop, which <laughs> you intend, you're not really sure why they're there, and you're just glad that you didn't send them when you were drunk. Yeah. Um, and about what I sort of thought about various things, and then I thought, well, I'll just, you know, I'll, if I have a point to make, it'd be nice to set myself the challenge of making it through stand up and not online or not in. In, uh, on Twitter or anything like that, because that, I don't think anything ever good has ever happened online. <laughs> I don't actually agree with what I just said there <laughs> at all. But, um, so I thought I'd write a stand-up routine about, because I was writing about love and how happiness affects your persona as a comedian, because it's much more useful if you're angry, and postulated the idea that the more successful comedians become the more miserable they have to pretend to be, <laughs> which fitted nicely into a brief routine about yeah. Stuart Lee. And what I did in the set myself the challenge of doing that was to apply his logic to him, which I think is absolutely valid. And never once uh, gave an opinion of him outside of that routine. And I like the routine, I stand, stand by it. And he didn't react well. <laughs> Um, which is absolutely fine, and but I I thought quite like the idea that my only ever sort of thing I've ever said about him is in that routine, and you can listen yeah. to that routine, and that's I'm glad that I made my point through that and not through some sort of snarky article or yeah yeah. Something. I mean it's you know it's an, it's an, well, it's an interesting thing I think comedically because it's about becoming you know if you become successful and earn lots of money it's you know that most comedians are starting from a point of being an under an underdog mm. and so if you it's it's a difficult thing for anyone to then cope with suddenly becoming yeah. very successful and earning some money yeah sure. and it's sort of a, just about inevitable and this is not uh, not just limited to S Stuart but it's about the hypocrisy of how it's possible the basic premise is how is it possible to complain that you don't earn much money in front of 500 people. Because uh, it's basic maths. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's sort of infuriating when you are genuinely fighting against an industry where you're fighting for yourself and your career to get a foothold in an industry. And then you hear one of the most successful people in that industry saying that it's hard for them. <laughs> and you think, well, I think I don't think it is. <laughs> I think, think things are going quite well. I think, and I think it's very difficult for uh, my generation to appreciate how difficult it is for your generation and then the, the even newer generation of comics. And I think if, by going back and doing clubs, you get a, be a better idea of it. Yeah. But it's, it's, there's so many people now, and we talked about this a bit, but like when we started doing Edinburgh in the early nine, late 80s, early 90s, there might be 50 comedians going up and doing a show, and now it's seven or 800 comedians well, pretty doing much a show. pretty so. much, when you started, basically it was just maths that everyone would win the Perrier. <laughs> it was. Because it was. there were like 10 comics, <laughs> and if they all went up to Edinburgh for 10 years, they'd all eventually just yeah. win the Perrier by default, because you can't win it twice. Yeah. So, so... It was easier then. <laughs> it was easier. But then but there neither was Stu or I ever got nominated for the Perry, which is probably where a lot of the issues we've had. But that's because we <laughs> were sort of household <laughs> name celebrities. Well, not to begin with. <laughs> I think that the fact is that at whatever stage <laughs> of your career you're at in a creative industry, because there is no uh, because there's no structured ladder to climb. Yeah. It's entirely nebulous, and the nature of improving as an artist is always to see the next rung, because you want to have a way of judging that you're getting better. So everyone, even the top big dogs, the super dogs of 
comedy must think, oh, why didn't I get that? Yeah, I think they do. I mean, that's been my new show, which is about whether about happiness and whether it's possible to make comedy out of happiness, which is a similar thing that you were talking about as well. It is about, you know, it's about real... I think it's very difficult to realise when you yourself have been successful. Mm. So I think that even even if from an outside eye, you think, oh, God, you know, someone else would look at someone and go, mm. they're doing amazingly well. Yeah, I think the, the tendency is to go, oh, look, that's not fair, that's not fair. And I think that's within a lot of comedians. That, and they're always striving to to go higher anyway. Yeah. So that's you know that's a da- that's a dangerous spiral upwards or downwards you can get into. I think so. It's, um, no, it's interesting. Um, I like that you had you did an interview with Bruce Dessau where he does his uh, his rarely asked questions. But you I, the one I liked you you were answering about you asked what what annoyed you and you said that the, you, your brain kind of keeps on making you think about certain things every time they happen. Mm. Uh, and you had one quite good example, which you remember what that was. Yeah, it was shower. Um, that I read an interview in, I think, 1994 with Johnny Vaughan when he just started on The Big Breakfast. And it said, he said, oh, how do you deal with the early mornings? And he said, uh, the most important thing is just get in the shower as quickly as you can and it'll wake you up. And f- just for some reason, my brain selected that and every time I've ever had a shower <laughs> since 1993, which is like between one and two a day, depending <laughs> on factors, I've thought about Johnny Vaughan. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't dislike Johnny Vaughan, but if I had to pick someone to think about 10,000 times, Saying one when thing. I'm always <laughs> naked, <laughs> And uh, it's Johnny Vaughan, and I sort of, because there's that, like, question in the interview was, what irritates you? So I started, it's, and it's that difficult thing with interviews when you're a comedian, is that do you, are you, do you try and be funny, or do you be serious, yeah. and both have pros and cons? So I started trying to think of, oh, what, are, what are those things that really people f- find <laughs> annoying these days? And then I realised that all of those things I do, and by definition, what annoys me the most is me, because... I am the source of all my annoyances, and I'm the most annoying person I know, and I can't escape myself, and I have no time to myself because I'm always there. <laughs> so it, I'm the most annoying yeah. person, and all my foibles and traits are what um, are what really get my goat. <laughs> I think it's an, it's an interesting observation. I don't know if that's true of everyone, because I have lots of things. But there, I have lots of little things like that that every time I do them, I think of a certain thing. Well, your brain but makes quite, connections yeah, yeah. between certain things. But you sort of wonder, will, in the end, will they be the only things that are left with you? you know, it's like every time I make a cup of tea, which I don't do that often because I don't drink tea that much. Right. But I think of the advert that Mark Lamar did where he told you about how putting less water in your kettle... I don't put less water in the kettle, I just think about that. Yeah, yeah, time. yeah. Every time I do. Because it's so, Martin Amar seems such an odd person to choose to do that message of yeah. ecology. And it's basically the last time I saw Martin Amar on TV <laughs> was him doing this, because he's chosen to go on the radio and do other stuff. Yeah. But it's like that was his, this, and it was such an odd advert, but every time I get, I think, oh yeah, so if you put a bit less water in the kettle, though, it'll be better for... And that will, you but will never I always, stop thinking yeah, about I'll never that. Stop thinking about and it. I've now had people come up to me and say, since I read your interview, every <laughs> shower I've had, I've thought about you yeah. thinking about <laughs> thinking about Johnny Vaughan in your shower. <laughs> Not even in my shower. And now, and now Johnny Vaughan is, does a show on the <laughs> same station that me and Ellis do a show on, yeah. on Radio X. So if I ever meet him, yeah. if I ever met him, I would think about me <laughs> stood in my shower thinking about the fact I think about Johnny Vaughan whenever I have a shower. So what if I went mad and just started taking my clothes off in front of Johnny Vaughan? And what if Johnny Vaughan and me said, oh, you're doing the breakfast show, I've got a tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd, and I'd say, I know what this tip, and I would really mess with his brain. You're going to tell me to have a shower. He'd be like, I didn't know you were an old pro. <laughs> it's a weird thing. Like the other one, when I'm ch- checking the blind spot, when I'm t- go- moving out into the centre lane in a motorway, I, like one of my girlfriends, uh, old girlfriends, used to always quite exaggeratedly do it. And since then, I start exaggerating doing it. And that's the only time I ever think about her is every time, like. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, especially but is that one thing you think that's what I mean? Like about all the other things fall away. I can't. I can remember other things about the relationship, but that's the almost the pervasive thing. Eventually, will that be when it gets to the end? Of life, how was that relationship? Oh yeah, she always looked over her shoulder. Like, yeah, very especially fastidious about checking the blind spot. And driving's a, a difficult one because you are taught to make associations yeah. in your brain in order to learn to drive, so that every action you will have. So I had a thing with my driving instructor. It was quite quite scary, per lady. Quite, sort of shout at me, and I'm not I'm very good in, yeah. in, in if shouting is involved in anything. Um, and I, when you turn the indicator to indicate right, you would turn the wheel, and then on a modern car, there's a click. And what that click means is that when you straighten up the wheel again, the indicator will automatically turn off. However, sometimes the corner, when you turn back, isn't enough of a, a corner for it to then click. So I click it off with my hand. And she would say, stop doing that, you're ruining, you're going to break the indicator mechanism. <laughs> and I think about that <laughs> every time I indicate. <laughs> and I have done in the past 30,000 miles a year yeah. driving to gigs. In each drive, I'll probably have indicated, I don't know, 100 times, 50, between 50 and 100 times. And I always remember her telling me off. And the same thing happens if I ever put on the handbrake without pressing the little button in. <laughs> and it goes, <laughs> or kind of makes that <laughs> noise. I'll hear her going, you're ruining my handbrake. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> I think it's an interesting, does everyone have that or is it just yeah. comedians? Everyone, everyone has it. So that's a good thing, not, well, I had one man said yes, and I've gone there, everyone has it. <laughs> really, for that to work, everyone would have had to say yes, wouldn't they? That, but that bloke's gone, yeah, they do. It's, no, it's only mental people who have it, mate, I'm afraid. <laughs> but good luck to us all. I'm gonna, I've got to do some emergency questions. Uh, yes, thank you. I've got some new ones. This is for you, Andy McCage. Uh, if you had to go... He complained that it wasn't in last week's show. <laughs> if you had to go for a week's holiday with one of the puppets from Spitting Image... Do you remember Spitting Image? Well, which would you choose? Uh, bear in mind that your holiday would also be with whoever operated the puppet and whoever did the voice of the puppet, but they could never acknowledge you. <laughs> they would always be in character. If you tried to interact with them as people, they would not. They would just blank you off. Right. They're not there. I can and see also, them. They're yeah, not always they're behind, <laughs> like, a wooden thing. No, they might try and hide a bit, but... I think, you know, realistically on a holiday situation... Would they be wearing be that nice. quite creepy black suit? Like, all black... Yeah, maybe the like puppet I think the wear. puppeteer guy would. The, I mean, the, sound, the guy, the impressionist, might be in a booth. <laughs> might get a, sort up a little booth in the... Though he'd have to come around, but he'd have to be with you all the time. But I don't think he would dress up, because the, the impressionist... So the puppeteer is there, yeah. operating it, and the person doing the voice of it... Is around, but he wouldn't stand right there. And he would be, be on the, the island as well. The, he'd be on the holiday and in the room with you all the time, so he yeah. could, otherwise you'd be able to have a conversation with the puppet. And where's the holiday? Well, that is also one of the... The puppet would choose the holiday destination. <laughs> and, that, that is, and again, that is not... That's, I mean, obviously the, the impressionist would have some part in that, but he would have to work out where he thought the puppet would want to go on Because what I'm seeing in this scenario is so many reasons why it would be absolutely awful yeah. for everyone involved. <laughs> and the choice of the puppet is going to have no influence on that whatsoever. Because <laughs> you're going to have probably, I don't know, Steve Coogan did a lot yeah. of the voices. Well, I mean, that'd be exciting, wouldn't it? It would be exciting for me. So he he would absolutely hate it, because yeah. he'd only be able to talk to me through Roy Hattersley. <laughs> and the puppeteer would hate it, because he'd have to... So they're not my friends. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have to spend all the time with them? Yes. So, <laughs> But it's like a nightmare. <laughs> but well, which puppet would you get the choice of? <laughs> <laughs> so it might, that um, might assuage the nightmare if it was a puppet. You were, I mean, but it might, remember, it would be 24 hours a day. I mean, when they were asleep, I don't know how that would work. I, the pu when they might have to have two puppeteers, one who operate the puppet, the puppet when they was asleep. Well, maybe they could... Sw up. No, swapping wouldn't help. Yeah. So you've I now mean, got two voice normal. artists and two puppeteers. I think the same voice artist could be... You just have to... <laughs> to nudge him awake. If you started talking to well, So the puppet, maybe what you'd end up with is you'd have to attach little sticks to the puppeteer <laughs> so that when the puppeteer was asleep, yeah, you could operate him as a puppet in order to operate the puppet. Yeah. And so you'd get an increasingly complex line of little sticks. 
because everyone's asleep being operated as a puppet, which then operates a person which... That might happen, but that is, you know, that's not what I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not interested in which, pu- which of the many puppets from Splitting Image would you choose to... Well, because... Uh, just, I mean, because it would be the only glimmer of fun or hope on this entire holiday. I just yeah. need to pick a figure who I like the idea of. Yeah. I remember so, it's the puppet, not the person. Yeah, yeah. So like, often the puppet was quite different than the, I the real. Get, Roy Hatsley never really spat in real life. No. Sure. So, you know, if you think, oh, I'll get Roy Hatsley. Was there a puppet of Tony Benn? <sighs> yes, yes, there was. Oh, I go for, yes, that lady says it was. I go for Tony Benn because I, um, I can do a bad impression of Tony Benn, so yeah. I would... I would probably try and push the sound voice of a guy yeah. into madness by talking back to Tony Benn in, in an attempt at Tony Benn's voice. I think after the end of a two-week holiday, all of you would be quite, probably quite mad anyway. Yeah, I think we'd be quite angry at whoever had organised this trip. <laughs> um, this is a good emergency question from Tim, Tur- Tim Turner. I'm no, under no obligation to repeat this. Tim Turner? Tim Turner. Like a time turner yeah, in worked, uh, Harry we? Potter. <laughs> Don't let anybody see you use it. <laughs> that surely is the answer to all of the problems. Uh, Richard Dawkins claims to have, ha- have seen. T- <laughs> I'll start again. Just edit that out. Richard Dawkins claims. I'll start again. Richard Dawkins claims to have seen dogs doing a 69. <laughs> What's the worst lie you have ever told to impress people? <laughs> Worst lie. Oh, that's not a fun thought road to wander down. Do you lie a lot? I, I, I would find this quite difficult. I don't really lie that much. No, to, my no, mum not could to impress always, people anyway. My mum could always tell when I lied because I would yawn. Really? Yeah. It was an odd sort of reaction I had. No, no, I'm just going to hang out with some mates. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no, nothing under the bed. <laughs> anyhow, you know, school. I know it's cool work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that anymore. Um, I once told a, I was, I sort of, I think in a bit like you, I sort of a magical thinker yeah. in that I will often associate everyday things with like potential fun results. So like any any iPhone game I play will the score will be how many pounds I get. <laughs> and that, I d- will do that four or five times a day. I'm yeah. on 33. <laughs> but I'll work, so boggle is the amount of pounds I'll get per day yeah. forever. And sometimes I'll play it where I get, it's just Monday to Friday, or sometimes it's seven days a week, but I pay tax. <laughs> <laughs> and what is so pathetic is that my scores in Boggle are always between 60 and 100. So basically, this is played out in my mind it's countless thousands of times, is me ending up making about minimum wage <laughs> that is either slightly higher and taxed or slightly lower and not taxed. And it's never going to be more than 100. And it's never going really going to be less than 50. Yeah. And it's a waste of everyone's time. And lots of things I do are attached to payments I get in per day. Yeah. <laughs> like if I can hold my breath to the next tube station, that'll mean I get 50 pounds a day. <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> and, um, so you're lying to impress yourself, is what you're saying. Well, you think, oh, I get 50 pounds, then where's my 50 pounds? It's oh, yeah. the... the, the this is a bit like what I was talking about, me being the most annoying thing in my life. Because if I spent 1% of the time I've spent equating basic daily tasks with an amount of pounds I get a day, forever, taxed or untaxed, sometimes Monday to Friday. If I spent 1% of the time I spent doing that, working on things that will earn me money <laughs> in the world that exists, yeah. I would earn a lot of money. Yeah. But I don't do that. Anyway, so that wasn't at all your question, was it? Oh, kind of. the lies. I once t- said at school that when the ice cream man came around to my house, because he'd park outside, we had a system, and if I let the blinds up, <laughs> it would mean that I was going to come and get an ice cream. 
if I had the blinds down, it would mean I wasn't going to get an ice cream. And if the blinds were halfway, it meant I wasn't sure if I was going to get an ice cream. <laughs> and I thought that if this rumour caught on, that people would think I was cool because me and the ice cream guy had a thing. <laughs> and which is a pointless lie. Because what happened was, the ice cream man came around and the blinds were as they were. He was unaware of this fantasy world. <laughs> I'd created yeah. in an attempt to win favour with the girls at school. As if they were going to go, hey, hey, there's John Robbins. Do you hear, hear about what he's got going on at the ice cream bar? <laughs> yeah, he's really cool since I heard about this because he's got a, a system with the blinds in his mum's living room. <laughs> Whereby there's a three different messages he can send out to the ice cream <laughs> man. I th yeah, let's kiss him next. <laughs> One of the messages is, I don't know whether I want an ice cream. <laughs> Which is <laughs> an entirely pointless thing to say. So it's like, he would drive past and go, oh, Robin's on the fence again. <laughs> Classic, whenever it's warm but overcast, he cannot make up his mind. Uh, if you were the Prime Minister, would you use nuclear weapons? For what? Well, they'd be like, weapons. Well, they'd be the ultimate sort of retro thing in a in a sort of a London gastro pub. <laughs> wouldn't they? You could use them as long seats, or you yeah. could serve a poached egg on one. <laughs> yeah, be quite. That would be quite funny. Well, a live nuclear missile. Because the know, egg could be kicked, cooked on the nuclear missile. Yeah. Um, if I <laughs> no, I would never use nuclear weapons. Never. No. no. What if they the, there were nuclear weapons coming over already? Well then, but why, so okay, so if nuclear weapons are coming to hit the country, yeah. we're all going to die. Yeah. So how is that made better by a lot of other people then dying? I agree with that, so I'm, I, I've made that similar point. But what if the other people were going to send a nuclear weapon, but they wouldn't do if you said you were going to use the nuclear weapons? So then that's not, would you use nuclear <laughs> weapons, it's would you say you would <laughs> use, which is this ludicrous, if you back engineer that, yeah. then you can just keep saying, well, I would say that I would say that I would say that yeah. I would say I would use nuclear weapons. Yeah. I would just, I wouldn't no. use them. I wouldn't use them either. I w I'd, I'd either use all of them or wouldn't use them. I'd get rid of them, keep yeah. the money, and say we've still got them. Yeah, that's I think that as well. Idiots. Yeah. S sometimes, Richard, I think it's people like you and me that should be the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for all the terrible errors we've made. <laughs> And when they go, can we come, can we come round and have a look at the missiles? You go, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Nick, make someone out of cardboard. Put the blinds halfway up. <laughs> <laughs> the blinds are halfway up. We're not sure whether we're going to use nuclear weapons. <laughs> hey, me and uh, can I ask you a hypothetical question? Yeah, please do. Because me and Ellis had one on our that came up on our radio yeah. show. And you're welcome to use it if you think it's of interest. Okay. But it, I found I'll it quite the, I'll interesting. I'll get my pen out, and then if, if I write it down, it's yeah. good. If I don't write it down, it's not good. <laughs> Was there a famous sort of mogul who used to do that? <laughs> Is that based on a... No, so, just my own cruelty. Which would, which would you rather have? Yeah. £100,000 yeah. in your bank account tomorrow? And that's yours to do with whatever you want. 100,000 extra on top of the, lo the lot I've got in there already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're not going to. I'm not taking that much of a hit. <laughs> <laughs> you can gain £100,000 net, 100, net tomorrow, yeah, okay. and that's yours forever to do with as you wish. Okay. Or you can have a million pounds in 50p's <laughs> in a silo, like a grain silo, <laughs> and you are not allowed to pay them into a bank account, change them up, <laughs> change them into another currency, or invest them in anything. You have to spend them in the form of 50p's. <laughs> but you can spend them on anything you want, yeah. forever. Yeah. Which would you rather have? And do I have to go to the silo every time I want to buy? Is the silo conveniently placed? The silo's convenient. <laughs> I mean, it's not walkable. <laughs> but then you wouldn't want you would take your car, because yeah. you, you're going to take like, a lot out at a time. Yeah. And you're, also, you, you're, you, you're not allowed... You are allowed, actually, to pay people to bag them up into little those £20 things. Yeah. But you're not, allowed to pay, you're not allowed to then pay them in anywhere. Okay. So the maximum you can have in any one 
go is twenty pounds of them, but you could pay with like five of those for something that was hundred pounds. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think people would still. I mean, if you went to buy a Ferrari, mm. um, I think they would still take the money. Well, no, it's not legal tender. But I think they would still take it over a certain amount because they can bank it, can't they? I yeah, mean, I think they'd be annoyed, but you could, be, there are weighing machines now and stuff you can use, so you can just go. And but it would take all day. Yeah, but they would still have sold a Ferrari. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So you know that's. Is that a light going? Yeah, light just light bulb just went. When they're all gone, we die. That's just <laughs> <laughs> the end of like, the show. Take me out, <laughs> which I've never seen. I'm guessing that's what happens. Is that what "Take Me Out" is? <laughs> An increasingly badly lit discussion on the stage. Uh, I think I would uh, take the million. You take pieces. the million in fifty yeah. p's. Because I reckon, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy. I'd be, I do a lot of work uh, for charity, and I count up coins all the time. So how much? That's what I do. I, when, admittedly, not in that volume, but I'll, at the end of a gig, I'll go and bag up fifty p's. So for if about you wanted an hour. to buy a Ferrari, say it's yeah. one hundred and fifty grand. Yeah, I don't want to buy a Ferrari, but no. if I wanted to, that's, so that's still more than hundred grand. I so that you can put them into twenty pound. Ten so pounds like fifty p's. That's like sixty thousand of those little bags. Yeah. And then the awkwardness of them telling you to <laughs> fuck off <laughs> when you turn up at a really high-end Ferrari dealer. What if I say I'll give you I'll give you two hundred thousand pounds worth of fifty p's for this hundred thousand? But pounds they would pounds. assume, I think, that the fifty p's were counterfeit, <laughs> and they would have to check each individual fifty p somehow. I'd just say, to, you know, take a bag at random out of the, my silo. Okay. Come to my silo. <laughs> I'll show you the fifty p's. Okay. I think it would still be. I've quite, you know, I just quite like to have that amount of fifty. It'd be useful for uh, parking meters and stuff. Yeah, it would be a talking point. <laughs> you could then sort of move could to I where the silo was. You could yeah. move your house around it. And what if I sold the silo for half a million pounds to someone else? No, you're not allowed to sell. You're not allowed to <laughs> in any way change the w how the money exists. But what about the silo, right? That's got to be on some land. Well, you, that's okay, if you it's can, near to where I live in Shepherd's Bush. You can sell the silo. That's still going to be worth like a hundred thousand pounds anyway. So I, no. could just, I could just <laughs> empty out the but silo. But it isn't, because the silo is in Kent. <laughs> <laughs> and is on a bad r railway line, that <laughs> which has got a bad reputation. <laughs> so like, a train's going to crash into the silo at any point. Well, when word gets out that <laughs> there's a million pounds in 50p's, you're also going to have to pay security. I'm not going to write the question down. <laughs> oh, um, it's a good question. It's good, it is a good question, but, you know, we've covered it. <laughs> Have you ever seen a ghost? Um, no. I once, when I was in Scouts, I was the Sixer. So I was in <laughs> yeah. charge of the Scout, my Scout Six. Yeah. And um, so far, this is a long way away from answering the question. Yeah. I'm just saying that. I'm hoping it's going to become more relevant. Well, our. our, <laughs> our, our I've just been wanting to get this into the interview. Our I word. was a sixer when I was a Cubs, <laughs> all right? And there hasn't been a question I've managed to get that into yet. And I demand respect. <laughs> um, and our Kayla and Bagheera and Shere Khan would always tell yeah. us ghost stories. Yeah. So I once told a ghost story on a night hike to my six about a wolf man who lived in a hut in the wood that we were in uh, to try and scare them. And I got so scared <laughs> that they had to call my mum <laughs> <laughs> to pick me up from the night hike because I'd scared myself with a, <laughs> with a story I had invented. But no, I've uh, never seen a ghost. No. no. Uh, well, it's been lovely talking to you, and thank you for coming along. Thank you for the emergency question. I would definitely use again. Uh, don't bother listening to the others, just in case. Uh, and uh, are you touring your last Edinburgh show? Do you tour, or do you, is the Edinburgh shows? I'm come sort and go? of looking into it. Um, a few things I was intending to do this year have not been possible, so we might, we hopefully, are, I am, may, might be putting a tour in. Um, definitely, uh, things are going really well. <laughs> um, but, but we can hear them online. Oh, you yeah, can hear the them. Hopefully, the new show will be online as well soon. Yeah, on Bandcamp, johnromans.bandcamp.com, yeah. and you can also 
um, download me analysis podcast from or iTunes. From XFM Radio X. Or listen on XFM. Yeah, or listen on, on, on... No one does that anymore, do they? No one listens. I suppose with breakfast shows, people listen to breakfast shows when they're... I think we do... We've, we've done 90 shows now, and we've got... People do listen live. That's, and that's good news. What? It's good news that people are listening. <laughs> yeah, people... <laughs> must be nice. We well, we've <laughs> definitely at least got 12 people at listen. <laughs> but the podcast is, is quite... When I, was on, when I was on Fubar Radio, I don't think anyone was listening. Hey, what's going on with Fubar? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I'm, obsessed, amazed it's, I'm obsessed with I'm it. I'm amazed it's still uh, going. But we have discussed this. Uh, have you? Because yeah. they don't charge anymore. No. So they, their income must be zero. <laughs> which is fascinating. Yeah, I don't understand. I, don't, I really genuinely thought they wouldn't last the year out. Yeah. And that was a couple of years ago, so... Who knows? Anyway, so, sorry, I don't XFM doing all right? The XFM it's called, good. we're not allowed to call it XFM oh, we're not anymore. anymore. We get in oh, trouble. Oh, is it because it, it's, it's Radio it's X for men. It's only for men. Yeah, men it's just for dudes. Yeah. No <laughs> chicks allowed. <laughs> Actually. Um, and it's just very dude heavy. At the yeah. It's just Yorkie bars everywhere. <laughs> and packets of McCoy's crisps. <laughs> and like Gillette razors. And... Porn, <laughs> but only like really no tasteful porn, just the sort of stuff that like if your girlfriend found you'd be like whoa. <laughs> uh, no, it's exactly the same as it was. It just happened that a rather cynical marketing memo <laughs> that all companies have got made public, yeah, which should, probably shouldn't have done. But you know, we think girls are good too. <laughs> They're allowed to listen. But they just choose not to, after that memo got leaked. Um, <laughs> we'd better go. But, uh, sorry, it's, it's ended on a bit of a, a downer. It, we, should, we should have ended after the Sixer story. And, you know, in a way, we can do that. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> but can, can you sort of, without it making too much sense, just keep in the plugs for my bank yeah, campaign? We can. No, we'll, we'll keep um, it all in. And Radio We'll X. keep it all in. It's nice. The embarrassing moments are what makes the non-embarrassing moments seem quite good. In, hind <laughs> in hindsight, people go, you know, there was a bit, it was a bit embarrassing at the end, but most of it wasn't embarrassing at all. So uh, that's a very good motto for life. <laughs> <It is. laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's John Robbins. Thank you. We'll be back after this short break. Be quick. The quicker you are, the more we can do after the break. Thank you. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>